Hello everybody, I am Ben from Team Panic and today we're going to do a quick tutorial on how to dye HDPE and get it into whatever colour you like. Uh, so HDPE obviously is a fairly common material in combat robots and it dyes a little bit differently to a bunch of other plastics out there. So let's get started with the basic materials and tools that you're going to need to do this. First up is a hot plate, and I would get, recommend getting one of these portable hot plates. You can usually pick them up fairly cheaply at secondhand stores. This one's an electric one, and I would kind of recommend that because it gives a decent control over temperature, because we're going to need to uh, keep our mixture of dye at a fairly good simmer as it dyes our piece of plastic. Next up, we have the plastic itself that we want to dye. These are two identical pieces. I'll be dyeing the one on the left here. And you need some weights to weigh this stuff down. HDPE will naturally float in water. You want to make sure that it gets weighted down. Personally, I just use bolts in whatever holes already exist in the part. And I try to use countersunk bolts because they have less of a contact patch on the actual part, so therefore there's less chance of them interfering with the die, and also because they're being put into a pre-existing hole, there is probably going to be a bolt here anyway, so if there's a little bit of die mist around the actual hole itself, it should be covered by a bolt in the final part. So with the plastic parts you want out of the way, we also have this, the star of the show, Rit Dye More. This is a synthetic fabric die, and it is the key ingredient to making sure that you can actually dye your plastic. This stuff will dye plastic. Basically anything else I've tried will not dye plastic. So make sure it's this Rit Dye More stuff. You can usually find this from kind of uh, fabric suppliers and craft stores and that type of thing. And they're not too bad for a bottle, especially considering that a bottle of this stuff goes a decently long way. Some important things. So gloves to uh, keep your the dye off your hands. Uh, some tweezers or pliers or anything else like that to allow you to grab the parts back out of the dye bath without putting your hands in. And of course a pop stick or something along these lines to stir your dye mixture to get it to a good consistency. And finally here we have the kind of consumables and bit other bits and pieces. So you need a vessel which is large enough to hold your plastic piece that is going to be dyed. In this case this is totally fine. Uh, and Personally, I use these aluminium trays, or have been up until this point. These are, have been a little bit flimsy, so I have a nice little kind of baking tray that sits underneath them just to give them a little bit more rigidity. Then you need a lid for this. Personally, uh, it's a good to have a lid that is nice and flat and doesn't have any screws or anything extra in it. I've been using these aluminium trays, so I've been using alfoil and wrapping it over the top to make a lid out of that. If you have a pot that has uh, a lid that's not actually got a bolt up through the middle, that would work as well. And then finally, vinegar. I've been using this uh, double strength vinegar, and if you want to use regular vinegar, you absolutely can. You just have to double the amount of vinegar in the recipe that I'm about to give you. So when you've got your stuff together, you need to know the mix that goes into your dye bath. So Take an amount of water that will cover your part correctly when it's sitting inside your container. Personally, I like to just round that to the nearest whole number. So for me, because I use a metric system, I round it to the nearest 100 milliliters. If you're using uh, the imperial system, round it to the nearest fluid ounce. And then from there, you need to work out how much dye and how much vinegar you're going to add to solution. So you need 4% of dye to water ratio. So if you have a liter or a thousand milliliters of water, you wanna put 40 mils of dye into that solution. If you, like me, are using double strength vinegar, you then use a 2% solution or 2% addition to the amount of water. So in this case, the one liter case, you would go for 20 mils of double strength vinegar. If you're not using double strength vinegar, double that amount, go 4%. So if you're using regular vinegar and regular dye and the rip fabric dye, it's 4% for both based on the amount of water that you put into your container. Now that you understand those values, we're gonna take all of this outside because this stuff needs to be heated, obviously with the hot plate, and it stinks. It's a really good idea to do this in a very well ventilated area, preferably outside. 
Outside and gloved up, I have the water in the vessel already ready to go. I've got 500 mils in here. So for the dye, we're going to want 20 mils of dye. And for the vinegar, we're gonna want 10 mils of dye. That's for those ratios that I was talking about just before. With those in, it's time to give everything a good old fashioned stir, grab the stirring stick and just swirl it round. Do this for a little while. Everything needs to be as well incorporated as you can possibly get it. The dye seems to wanna to sink to the bottom of the mix, especially at the start. So just give it a really, really good stir until you're not seeming to move anything off the bottom and everything seems to be fair Fairly well incorporated into the mix. It seems to be getting pretty close here. I think I'm relatively happy with that. Just make sure you're getting everywhere and really scraping along the bottom to try and get that dye to jump back up into solution correctly, which is where you want it. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's going to be pretty good. I'm going to put this aside. And the next thing to do is to put our part into solution. So because I've got gloves on, I'm just gonna drop this in by hand. It's easier to place it in by hand, I find. And oh, you can see I might actually need to go and get some extra weight because this side seems to be popping up out of solution. And anywhere you can see white like this, it's not going to dye properly because the dye just cannot penetrate up this high, uh, basically as the plastic is sticking out of the liquid. Uh, so the other thing I might be able to do is I might be able to tighten down my nuts and bolts and force the plastic to rest a little bit closer along the bottom. Doing this though will tighten the pressure down on the plastic and make it more likely that there's going to be no dye in underneath my weights. Now let's see if this has worked. Oh, it's close. You can kind of just see at the back here that I've got a corner poking up. I'm going to add more weights to this before setting it off. Now that the part is weighted down correctly, it's time to cover and leave. So the covering just helps to avoid uh, boiling off all of your dye. And it also helps uh, prevent extra stuff from getting in to your uh, dye bath, which would be bad. You wouldn't, don't want contaminants in here. Once you have everything covered, I'm gonna recover this corner in just a second because I've got a rip in my alfoil here. Uh, it is time to turn on your hot plate Get it to something that's gonna give a good simmer, but not a rolling boil. You do not want to boil off all of your dye bath. You want to make sure there's still some of that left at the end of this, and preferably enough that it's still covering the part entirely before the end of this process. So we're going, I'm gonna put mine to about a three, kind of two and a half, three, somewhere in this range, and then leave this for a full hour. After an hour, it is time to turn off the heating element and allow everything to cool. At this point, you can, if you want to, remove the top covering and take your part out, which in my case, I'm gonna give that a shot. However, everything is quite hot here, so be very, very careful if you're going to do this. You might need an extra pair of gloves, a pair of gloves that can handle heat. Uh, and also be warned, of course, that there will be steam happening if you've done everything perfectly right. So at this point, once everything is cooled down or if you've got the top cover off either way, you can remove your part from the dye bath and leave to dry somewhere. For me, I'm just going to leave it to dry on the edge of my little platform here. You can already see that is quite a nice bright color that I've got out of this. But we're gonna leave this to dry for half an hour or so, just to let it actually dry off and yeah, get rid of any extra dye that might be floating around in it or on it. And there we go, once the part is dry, it is fully done and dusted. And uh, yeah, part is now fully dyed and ready to go. The dye is not very deep into the surface of the HTPE, so damage taken to these parts will reveal the underlying color, but uh, you can probably just re-dye this, I would assume. I haven't actually tried that yet, but it would potentially work. And yeah, that's about it. I will say mine is a little bit defective. There's a little bit of um, dust and grime that was left in my aluminium tub before I did my dyeing process. And some of that has been transferred into the part, which isn't great. 
Uh, but if you clean off your part and your tub and your bolts and whatever you're using to weigh down your part, everything should come out quite okay. You can uh, drop down the amount of dye if you don't want the color to be quite this deep, but don't go below uh, 2% dye. We're using 4%, don't go below about 2% because you will just get a very, very washed out color. Remembering you're adding the color to a natural white, so anything you do, you're going to get uh, a lighter color than you're expecting. So uh, the 4% the dye works pretty well and gives a nice deep color, which is fairly uniform as well, which is really quite nice. Anyway, that is gonna be it for this video. I hope you guys have enjoyed that one. and I will see you in the next one.